Hey everyone, this is a re-upload of my previous video on the self-help movement. One of the subjects of the video, copyright struck me and that's why it went down and I have to remove all the so-called copyrighted materials even though they were under fair use. But I'm too poor for a lawyer to fight it, so here I am. Anyway, that's what happens, that's why I'm re-uploading the video. Please help me share it around a little bit more because the view count got reset to zero and that kind of sucks. Uh, yeah, thanks. On to the video. My last few videos have been quite dark and serious, so let's lighten the mood today by talking about the self-help movement. I'm sure it'll be a quick, simple, and not at all complicated topic. It'll be fine. Don't don't look at the time code. That the time code can't hurt you. <laughs> Recently, I've met someone who is a leader in a self-empowerment community, and they were just interesting. But it made me think about these empowerment groups or self-help groups and figures in the self-help movement as I will be generalizing for this video. This includes self-help gurus, spiritual leaders, life coaches, social healers, and whatever other flowery buzzword like life sharer or come general, etc. I thought about finding a local group to join, like infiltrate spy, but I can do it for a reason I will elaborate later that's not just because I'm too lazy and poor. Well, those two, but not just because. Trigger warning, we'll be talking about mental health, abuse, suicide, depression, and there is a segment with some weird flashing lights and loud noises. I warn you when the lights are about to come up, but it's quite late in the video, so just enjoy the show first. Buckle up, take a deep breath, meditate, let's get started. My first goal was the punch within my weight class, so to speak. I could have gone for the low-hanging fruits, the Jordan Petersons the, or Deepak Chopras of the world, but they've been thoroughly debunked by people far smarter than me. Links below. So through a couple of recommendations and randomness, I went to my local library, picked out a few selected self-help authors, and spent a whole day reading. By the way, support your local libraries, they're great. And the first thing I noticed about how these self-help advice works is that they are a numbers game. It's an industry that banks on the idea that most people are like most other people, and that most people like to think they are not like most other people, or at the very least want to be like not most other people. They don't want to be like other people even though they are. I would good. If you look through books within the genre, you'll realize very quickly that the things in them are applicable to almost anyone throughout most of a person's existence. They are what's called Barnum statements in an overturned window of life. Things that can be applied to a general audience because of how universal they seem. The light you see within others is within you. Or the market always goes up. Really child-level statements that affects a majority of people and situations, the no-shit Sherlock levels of advice. If you are part of a neurotypical community or a general populace with systemic privileges, these bottom statements will feel incredibly justifying. Basically, if you're anywhere here on the journey of life, these statements will tickle your G-spot, so to speak, because they itch on the edge of what the general populace would experience as extreme. These incredibly basic levels of self-awareness will feel life-changing even. It's the same as how rich people will progressively assign more and more trivial issues as bad. Oh no, my favorite Ferrari broke down, now I have to drive this Audi instead! Journalist Caitlin Moscatello calls this the Fleischmann effect. Because their window of what hardship is have shifted. Because they are not exposed to or have knowledge that others can suffer far further than that edge of their imagination. They start to think that this is the edge. For example, the titular poor dad in Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad is a successful educator in academia. Kiyosaki's benchmark for poor is prolific academic success. Just think about the message that sends out. This allows for a level of self-selection on par with the Nigerian prince scam. The same way advanced fee scams tends to have poor language to target people who also have poor reading comprehensions, the people who will read Kiyosaki's books and attend his seminars are people who think a successful career in academia is poor. These people likely already have a decent amount of money and social status and are already leaning towards the side of business. To them, Kiyosaki's poor dad is on the edge of imaginable suffering. And if you can come back from this edge, the most horrible situation they can possibly imagine, then everyone should be able to do it too. Your life sucks? Well, I just followed these instructions and I got my life back together, so I'm sure you can do it too. 
And this is pretty much the same tactic used by these self-help gurus. These tactics do not account for pre-existing wealth, privilege, race, health, or any other systemic issues. And maybe you're thinking that I don't agree with Kiyosaki just because I'm a woke moralist, commie, socialist, Antifa, whatever, blah blah blah. And he's a Trump supporting fucking nut job, allegedly. So okay, let's talk about a self-help guru, I'm sorry, life coach that I theoretically side with. Let's talk about Hun Ming Kuang. Is it Hun or Han? I really should check this out. <laughs> Hun's book was recommended to me by an acquaintance when researching this topic and I'm picking him out specifically for two reasons. One, he is, as far as I can tell, a lefty-ish. And B, the self-help he's peddling is in a topic I have some level of knowledge in. Mental health. His author bio calls him a spiritual teacher, professional artist, social healer, life coach, and community leader, which is just like mwah, perfect for the topic, just short of a guru or come general. And in terms of self-help, his books are fine. They are all just interviews with professionals in the mental health community or politicians and social workers. So quite harmless stuff, but also not really self-help. His self-help persona comes from his talks, seminars, events, and a community group he founded, which, uh, which, oh, the group, we will, we will get back to his group. His book series, Treading Woes, are honestly just interview transcripts. They seem like a genuine effort to do some good in the mental health sphere. As far as self-help books go, they're fine. Not great, but not harmful. They get my official seal of eh, approval, but, and oh yes, the but, it has issues. Let's hope the problems are just with the books and not with the author, because that <laughs> would would be bad. Hun is the interviewer in a majority of these interviews, and because of the transcript nature of the books, you get to see some of his personal beliefs and worldviews unfiltered through his questioning. For example, out of the 75 interviewees, less than 6 of them even mention having a chronic or serious mental health disorder. I was speed reading so I might have missed one or two, but even at a conservative estimate, that's still less than 10% of the people interviewed. The interviewees are mostly politicians, doctors, self-help gurus, I'm sorry, life coaches, and people in the mental health industry, which are fine, don't get me wrong. But for books about the invisible threat of mental illnesses, you'd think that'd be more you know, people who are invisible instead of the most visible and prominent figures in the country. Hun also keeps dodging away from topics about how finance and class structure affects mental health. He has an almost childlike understanding of business structure and how they disproportionately affects workers and seems to think that just clearing the air with management will institute change. Whenever finance is brought up, he seems to almost magically swerve away from the topic and there's an unhealthy focus on the power of individual awareness instead of the required sweeping systemic changes many parts of society need. It's not really surprising. Hun is a guru, I'm sorry, life coach, and so the people surrounding him will be from a certain level of privilege and wealth. People with stable jobs, expats, you know, middle class and above people. Aside from that, I keep coming across a few terms in his books which I would like to explore. One of them is the term life coach. The term life coach or more specifically ICF certified coach keeps popping up during my research. According to Hun Ming Kuang, he himself is an ICF certified coach. He even interviews a few of them for his books. Another random financial self-help book I picked up was also written by one of these ICF certified coaches. Which brings up the question, what is? The International Coaching Federation or ICF is a non-profit organization that certifies professional coaches. Cool? Fine. An organization that makes sure people are qualified for coaching sounds good. Though their guideline seems a little messy and regulations are a little weird. It's probably fine. Right? But, and again, there's a but. Looking into the ICF's history has been an absolute pain because there's nothing much on them. Nothing good, nothing bad, just that they exist. They are the most suspiciously quiet international accrediting organization I have ever looked into. And if I had a dollar for every international accrediting organization I looked into, I'd have two dollars, which isn't a lot, but it's strange that it happened twice. The similarly functioning IAAPS or YAPS, which accredits pilots instead of coaches, were founded in the same year, but has a far clearer public trail. And if I had to guess why we're lacking so much information on the ICF, I'd say they might be allegedly hiding something or not have enough people look into their history. 
The ICF was founded by Thomas J. Leonard, whose middle name is lost to the abyss because he decided to have two first names. A personal coach, Leonard was an employee at Earhart Seminars Training, or EST, a former self-help cult, I'm sorry, seminar, which was founded by the self-help guru Werner Hans Erhardt, who changed his name from John Paul Rosenberg to sound smarter after abandoning his wife and four children in poverty and running off with another woman. So nothing unethical there. Thomas J. Leonard also founded Coach U, Coachville, and the International Association of Coaching, all of which provides paid coaching education that are recognized by the ICF. ICF does this by having coaches be mentored by ICF certified coaches and schools, by paying of course, so that the coaches in training will then one day be able to take the ICF coaching assessments and tests so that they can become ICF certified coaches who can coach other coaches in training to become coaches, 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 coaches. In 2011, the ICF launched the EU for a protection initiative to keep coaching a self-regulated profession, meaning that it can continue without any oversight from government or academia. But they do have a page on their website where you can report to them if someone is trying to regulate them. And that's not shady at, at all. Getting a basic accreditation from the ICF can cost a person around $6,000 and $400 for renewal, which is a steep cost considering that getting an associate accreditation takes only 120 hours to qualify for if you really just go for it. That's like three work weeks, I think. So to recap, the ICF is a non-profit organization founded by the employee of a former self-help cult, uh, I'm sorry, seminar, with a lot of for-profit coaching organizations that rely on its accreditations, an accreditation which it relies on itself to regulate with coaches trained by itself or by the school accredited by itself an organization that relies on itself to train other coaches accredited by itself this doesn't seem right oh uh, by the way i am legally required to say that this is not an accreditation mail or pyramid scheme test test hey future aiden here Seeing as how this script has completely gone off pace, I'm going to tack on a little something that I missed out. I want to talk about legally protected term. Legally protected terms are phrases or titles that are regulated by government or academia. They can also have different levels for different users. For example, a professor is not a legally protected term, unlike a doctor. I can call myself Professor Aiden, but without a doctorate, I cannot call myself a doctor. Further still, a doctor is not on the same level as an MD, which requires not just a doctorate, but also medical training. If you use these terms without the right qualification, you can get into legal trouble. The problem with organizations like the ICF is that it is not regulated by government or academia. There's no real legal repercussion for someone to call themselves a coach. Instead of going through the legal route to be certified a counselor, therapist, or psychologist, someone can just call themselves a life coach and claim to provide the same or similar service. I can call myself a life coach. They can get the ICF accreditation before or after and it doesn't matter. Unlike legally protected terms, it's hard to argue that these unregulated terms, credited or not, are there to protect consumers. However, getting these accreditation do protect people who are using these unprotected terms from defamation laws. Singapore in particular is famous for its use of defamation laws, which is why throughout the video I've been saying this. Let's talk about a self-help guru, I'm sorry, life coach, former self-help cult, I'm sorry, seminar, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, life coaches, life coach, seminar. Terms like self-help gurus were popularized in the 60s to 80s. There were more people willing to take advice quoted in words of mysticism and exorcism then. But as the world globalized and snake oils are slowly replaced with corporate speak, weight loss experts are now nutritionists, gurus are now coaches. The legally protected terms are not available to these people, so they tend to go for the next best professional sounding thing. And all this was going on in the background of my research until I found out that Hun Ming Kuang is not ICF certified. Remember when that's what this video was about? I asked ICF if they held records of former coaches to see if Hun maybe used to be ICF certified and also as a way to check for any disqualified coaches. And they told me that those records are not available for public viewing. Jesus Christ. Nothing suspicious or ethically wrong there either, I must legally say. Okay. So maybe Hun isn't a certified coach. Big deal. Not like that means anything now. Did he just lie? Maybe he just didn't renew his certification. Even with such a low requirement? You can literally do coaching or 
study for 40 minutes a week and you will qualify to renew your ICF accreditation in three years. That's less time than it takes to watch the Power Rangers movie. No, I'm talking about the good one. No, the good one. Yes, this joke is just for you, Ranger Nation. But it's really starting to seem like this is an entire industry built on grips inside of grips, like a nesting doll of grips. Every time I disassemble one grip, I find another one hidden in a corner. So maybe let's bring it all back to what they say. Maybe it's what these people preach that are good and important. A lot of people manage to do good work within shady systems. So let's take a look at Hun's mental health philosophy. I'm sure that's totally good and unproblematic and he is qualified to help and will in no way be possibly harmful whatsoever. Aside from the Barnum statements, Hoon keeps bringing up two other terms in his books and seminars, awareness and inner troops. Hoon makes it very clear in his books that I could get my hands on that his definitions of awareness and mindfulness are two very different concepts. He doesn't actually ever explain properly what mindfulness is to him, nor does he talk about what awareness is, and I am not paying for his causes because fuck that shit. But from what I managed to piece together, his definition of awareness is the ability to identify yourself in the world, the ability to know that you exist as a person and your ghost and self and be aware of those things and aware of the world around and it's blah 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 blah. It doesn't matter. And inner truths are just buzzwords to mean personal goals, ideal self and things along the line. It's manifestation BS. You can literally Google manifestation BS and find similar talking points. And to understand why none of this matters, you need to understand the difference between mental health and mental illnesses. Mental health is something that everybody has. These are your anxieties and your grief. They can be managed or completely avoided if you take care of yourself or if society is accommodating. Mental illnesses are disorders and sicknesses that only affects a portion of the population. These are your chronic or severe mental health conditions like anxiety disorder or depressive disorder or schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. They cannot be avoided. If you have them, you have them. They can be managed and they might be curable, but getting it is out of your control. Basically, all mental illnesses are mental health issues, but not all mental health issues are mental illnesses. Think of them as the difference between having muscle cramps and having multiple sclerosis. The awareness that Han speaks of is a passive meditation technique, something that runs automatically in the back of your mind, while the more commonly used mindfulness is an active meditation technique. There are some overlaps in these techniques, but their effectiveness differs. Awareness helps if you are not in active mental health situations. You are, for all intents and purposes, normal and would like to keep it that way. But it is next to useless if you are someone experiencing active trauma. And I'm gonna say something that Hun Ming Kuang should have said on page one of his books or the first five seconds whenever he opens his mouth to speak on this topic. I am not qualified to talk about this. And neither is Hun. Because Hun, and get this, isn't a trained therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or anything. He's an architect. Wait a minute, this isn't the LinkedIn profile from before. He couldn't be trying to hide his past qualifications by creating an entirely new profile with drastically different qualifications, could he? No, that'd be dishonest. I mean, the earliest activity I could find from him was when in 2015, he was a campaign manager for Dream Singapore, a society run by a co- Jesus, it's it's another coach. It's, it's, it's another fucking coach. They're all coaches. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, please let this end. Sorry, I got sidetracked again. Wow, this video is a real roller coaster. Uh, where were we? Ah, mindfulness. Mindfulness is required for active trauma therapy because it's the act of grounding. People with severe mental illnesses mostly don't have trouble going inwards, but rather have issues remembering they are part of the world. It's a phenomenon called disassociation. Basically, having trouble remembering that I'm here. This, this is real. This is all real. It's <laughs> This association is what active meditation helps with. And meditative therapy of any kind is really hard to do, especially if used on someone in severe active trauma by someone without proper training. 
An important part in all this is to open up an individual to traumatic experience, which is very dangerous. It can cause anxiety, physical pain, and even psychosis. The reason why Hon's definition of awareness and mindfulness doesn't matter is because he isn't qualified to conduct therapy, even though he actively does so, in the exact way I'm describing. Because, and I'm going to repeat this, he's an architect. He's not trained in any form of meditative therapy. What he is doing is scratching the surface of a very powerful, very complicated process. His techniques works for his crowd because they have already cultivated an in-group. The people who go to him aren't doing it because the techniques are proven effective for everyone. They are staying with him because it's effective for them. For example, most meditation doesn't work for me because I have a condition called aphantasia. My therapy has to be specially tailored. What is he going to do if I show up? People in vulnerable situations do show up to his sessions. Is he equipped to handle the tailored treatment they need? But hey, as long as gurus, sorry, life coaches like him, don't peddle pseudoscience and mysticism and don't take advantage of their vulnerable clients for an obscene amount of money selling them fake cures and magical woo products that might be misguided, but still borderline ethical, right? No, we're not doing the f f shadow choke again. I'm running out of head to clip. Just show it to me. Show me the truth. I can take it. This is a master crystal skull whose name is Mikado. <laughs> By the way, let's talk about the community group who Ming Kuang founded. Disconnect today. Is it disconnect today or disconnect dot today? I don't know, man. This video really got away from me. <laughs> disconnect is a grown up movement, advocacy platform, mental health awareness, community, blah, 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 buzzword, buzzword, buzzwords. The self help movement really loves buzzwords, okay? So, foregoing all their flashy self titles, from what I can tell, it's a social community slash group that hosts monthly sessions on mental health awareness. They do meetups and art therapy events organized by the architect Hun Ming Kuang, the architect. But for simplicity, I'm just going to classify them as a self help group because that's what they seem like, to be honest, and I don't really know what to call them and they don't really make it clear. I wasn't actually going to talk about this group much because it seemed like another genuine attempt by Hon at creating a safe space to talk about mental health issues. Like his books, it was going to get the official aid and seal of approval until I found this. Disconnect has been alleged to be a cult, and the more I dig into this, the more I find this compelling. But because of Singapore's defamation laws, I cannot legally say this group is a cult. So legally, I won't say this group is a cult. Mm. Aside from actively slut shaming someone and misattributing the medical issues of addiction, there are accounts from former participants about the techniques used in their meetings, described as cult like. I wanted to go to one of these meetings, but some of the people recognized me on a not friendly note, and I don't think I would be able to get a genuine experience that way. Which is why if you want to help me afford the money to hire random strangers from the internet to do weird things in the future, sign up for patreon.com slash Aiden. Oh man, this is the right. Okay, so I honestly thought that segment of the video was going to end on that dumbass joke there. But at the start of researching Disconnect, I actually found a couple of people who had went to their sessions who were talking about their experience online and I had messaged pretty much all of them. None of them replied for about a month. I, I, I thought that was a dead end, that, you know, it's just a throwaway account. People were trying to stay anonymous and whatnot. But last week, someone did end up replying, and we messaged back and forth. It was really interesting. And they pretty much confirmed everything I suspected about Disconnect and Hun Min Kuang. So what Disconnect does is something called trauma bonding session. It's very common in cults, in religion, in, in armies. You put your recruits, class, Lion, flocks, whatever, in, to a highly emotional situation where people have a uh, heightened emotions, where their participants basically go through talks or sharing sessions 
of talking about really traumatic stuff like abuse and depression and mental health and things like that. And at the end of these sessions, participants tend to end up very susceptible to the relationship of the people that went through with them. Also very malleable to suggestions. So once these sessions are over, disconnects organizers will go through Poon Ming Kwong's teachings and pitch his books at the end. It is standard televangelism stuff. You will see this if you just watch any televangelist on TV. And at the end of the session, at the very, very end, when everyone's leaving, these leaders will pick out a person from the crowd. I don't know what their criteria is, but they will pick out people from the crowd that they think are able to move further or just steamroll through and just try to get them to go further. And these people will get pushed on to meet uh, Hun Ming Kwang. The person that I messaged with, they managed to get all the way to meeting Hun Ming Kwang himself and their experience was interesting. And at the face-to-face -face meeting, Hun Ming Kwang offered his 800 plus, 2000 plus dollars sessions, which, you know, and I gotta reiterate, man, he's an engineer. He's not He's not qualified to do any of this. I don't know why. It's been two months. I want this video to end now. <laughs> Disconnect's teachings are incredibly superficial. Advice like doing things out of fear is bad is peddled on their social media alongside a barrage of generic life quotes like... Wait, are they, are they quoting Teal Swan? Teal Swan is a cult leader. Why are there so many Teal Swan quotes? It's like quoting Adolf Hitler on why war is bad. <laughs> a anyway, doing things out of fear is bad. Which, as a statement, on the surface, fair enough. But what if your fear is justified? What if you're a victim of abuse and your abuser asks you to do something that you don't want to do? With threats of violence, even. You're afraid, right? By the logic of the methodology, you shouldn't do it. But if you don't, your life is in danger. People in abuse situations must be handled with absolute care because they are vulnerable, as a lot of people in these kind of crises are. This group doesn't understand actual mental health challenges. It understands wellness in the catchy, inspirational, Pinterest quote kind of way. Those generalized nonsense are all over their social media. These kind of empowerments are too generalized because they are blanket beliefs that relies on treating individuals as a group with similar functioning lives. And the key word there is functioning. Your lives have to be functioning for these advice to work. They are Barnum statements for the people who are not in vulnerable circumstances. They are for, to put it kind of bluntly, privileged neurotypicals. And to really understand how superficial an understanding of mental health issues this self-help group has, we just have to look at their website. Warning, flashing lights, loud noises, skip to the time code if needed. This website hurts. I asked a friend with obsessive compulsive disorder and they stated that page caused them physical discomfort. And another friend on the autism spectrum was almost overloaded by a loud, unskippable, unprompted music that started playing on a page without their permission. Even I felt my panic disorder kicking into gear when bombarded with all these colors and movements. If you are someone who suffers from any number of chronic mental illnesses or are on a neurodivergent spectrum, this website run by a spiritual leader focused on mental health awareness and wellness absolutely eats dog shit for people who are mentally ill or neurodivergent. It's fashion. It's fashion that appeals to and I say this with love, normies. There is zero empathy or mindful consideration for how this website will affect the neurodivergent community. It hosts all the outward portrayals of help, but when the going gets tough, when we're actually required to put some effort into researching what people who are neurodivergent need, the level of care vanishes. Because here's the thing about Disconnect, and especially their founder, Hon Ming Kwang. And I'm going to keep repeating this. He's just a guy. He's not a psychiatrist or psychologist. He's not even a trained counselor or therapist. He's an architect. His friend committed suicide, and that made him want to help. And while that is incredibly admirable, it doesn't grant him any qualification or knowledge on the actual subject of mental illnesses. I have a friend that committed suicide. 30 years of experience battling chronic mental illness, 11 years of therapy, 8 years of activism, 5 suicide attempts, a handful of video essays, 1 published story, and 1 documentary on mental health under my belt. And even I don't think I'm qualified to 
help anyone, let alone be a spiritual leader. He's been talking about mental health stigma being the biggest hurdle in raising mental health awareness, even though stigma and awareness have not been the main issue in the community for a long time. We have other things like finance, healthcare accessibility, and job availability to think about now. Because mental health isn't just an issue with an individual or societal outlook and personality. It's a healthcare and systemic crisis. It's as if someone says, hey, my house is on fire, can you put out the fire? And the fireman says, exactly. We need to get rid of matches. Like, the matches are a problem, sure, but it's not the main problem now. Have someone put out the matches, yes, but maybe point the fire extinguisher at the fire first? Steve Salano, author of the book Sham, How the Self-Help Movement Made America Helpless, actually has a term for this kind of toxic empowerment. He calls it happyism, where followers of a self-help ideology embraces these self-empowerment teachings to the point where they live and act with the genuine belief that self-happiness is the most important thing to achieve, even at the cost of the welfare of other people around you. The angle of their happiness justifies every mean. They will put out all the matches because that makes them comfortable, disregarding every fire in the background. And from my personal experience speaking with members of Disconnect, yeah, that sounds about right. The rhetoric of self-help culture is, if I can do it, so can you. Completely ignoring that some people have licks and you might not. People in poverty are expected to be able to follow Robert Kiyosaki's teachings just as much as someone in middle class or high wealth. Things like systemic racism, generational wealth, and class zoning doesn't even matter to him. And you are expected to benefit from Ho Min Kwang's teachings regardless of your level of mental crises. Remember when I told you I didn't go to one of Hoon's disconnect session in person? The reason is because I have a panic disorder in places and events like those. It takes an immense amount of effort for me to put myself in certain situations. I will literally have a panic attack and drop to the floor, physically paralyzed for up to an entire hour. I don't have anxiety. I have a panic disorder. I didn't forget to do breathing exercises. I'm sick and sometimes disabled. And here's the danger about groups like these. What are these people going to do if someone is having a psychotic breakdown in one of their sessions because they were going through their unregulated meditation and a serious trauma trigger comes up? They do not have the decade of experience my therapists have. The counseling center I used to go to, the hired counselors in training, had buttons on the wall to be pressed in case of emergencies like these where trained professionals will come and help de-escalate the situation. Where is this connects button? These people, these patients, might undergo a genuine biological mental health crisis where the chemical balance in their brain breaks. They don't need good vibes, positivity, and a go-get-them attitude. They need fucking health care. So yeah, self-help. Really should have looked into it. I'm a victim if you think about it. I didn't want to do this. I thought it was just going to be a fun look in self-help movements. It's Dan Olson's fault. He did a video about the Mickelson twins and it looked fun. So I tried to do one too. Ugh. Bad influence. Naughty folding ideas. Think of the children. <laughs> if self-help helps you, congratulations. I am genuinely happy for you. But you're not everyone. Self-help only works when the individuals involved share like problems, situation, and culture. It's in the name self-help. It helps people like yourself. And if you have a misconception about how severe your situation is, you won't be able to identify people different from you. It self-selects. The people who go into a self-help group are the type of people who will go into that group. So to pretend or think that everyone should join you to challenge every other form of therapy and teachings and to point out other people's flaws and push your own success and to put your method as something that works for everyone and not just a certain type isn't help. It's propaganda. And if you ask me if self-help is a good or bad thing, I personally say it's terrible. Because while I cannot deny that the self-help movement has made life better for some people, I think its end game is a cult. There's a reason why cults have historically come from either religion or the self-help movement. They are communities specifically catered to creating in-groups that think people outside their group are wrong that they just haven't found their method yet and have a tendency to follow charismatic individuals or bodies. The difference is that in self-help, 
I'm sorry, life coaching, the people are trained to be charismatic. It's a case of toxic individualism for people who thinks that because something worked for them, everyone else is either wrong or close-minded. It's us against the world. All packaged in easily digestible buzzwords and Barnum statements that cost $50 per entry or $8,000 courses. And don't forget to tack on the $1,400 deck of magic tarot cards and side hustles of crystal skulls. Michelle Goodman, a former self-help author, wrote for Vox about how she gave up on being a self-help guru. I was starting to feel irresponsible. Like, the only way I could keep doing this was to forget about all the people my one-size-fits-all platitudes couldn't help. But with coachology comes great responsibility. Responsibility to offer advice you know works, preferably advice you've put to the test yourself. Responsibility to rise above bullshit artistry. Responsibility to not try to solve people's problems you are in no way equipped to fix. Advising others on how to steer their professional lives and livelihood was a job I no longer wanted. This wasn't just a crisis of skills or cash flow. It was a crisis of conscience. Self-help is flawed because in the grand scheme of things, it's the easy way out. Just read this book, go listen to some guru, sorry, life coach, and you can change your life. But that's just not how it works. Help, genuine help, like therapy and counseling and financial fiduciary guidance, good ones, are hard and they can be expensive. But they are not more expensive than self-help. A monthly subsidized counseling session at my local counseling center costs the same as one of Disconnect's monthly session fees. And they won't even spam you to buy books. They can take weeks, months, even years to show results. But they work because they don't assume people as monoliths with cure-alls. A good therapist or psychologist or even a trained counsellor will find out about your background, culture, family, stress level, trauma and health before they even start planning a treatment tailored to you. They might even recommend changing therapists if they think they are not a good fit. Are there bad ones? Sure, like in every other field. But the good ones, they can spend hundreds of hours of their careers treating singular clients because they know the problems that affect people are different for everyone. That everyone have different lives and that not everyone will react well to the same thing. They know everyone is different. That everyone in this society of 8 billion stupid apes is an individual unique in experiences of pain and joy, successes and failures. And no one person or organization holds the answer to an entire field of questions. Here, we are all individuals. Every one of us. All our own. Oh, that was a long ass take. <sighs> Thanks for watching. Thanks to my Patreon as usual, patreon.com slash Aiden underscore Ung. Subscribe, like, comment, share, whatever YouTube stuff. And uh, welcome to my sudden influx of subscribers from my benches and incel videos. I did not expect those videos to do as well as they did, but welcome to my channel. This is what I do. I stare at the camera and uh, I pretend I'm morally superior to everybody. <laughs> Don't listen to me, I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything what I'm saying. I've been researching this for about two months now. It's the longest, most intensive research I have done. Mostly because of the size and individual of the group and people I'm talking about, they're not particularly large. Researching isn't easy. Uh, I didn't expect to go down the ICF rabbit hole, that's for sure. I had a, I had a thing for self-help gurus when I was in the, the whole incel thing. And yeah, it, it's, it's bad, you know. But yeah, I didn't realize this was going to be a deep dive, but it was. I don't want to do it again, but I have a feeling I will. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. I hope you individual apes will live happy and healthy lives. Bye. <laughs>